So as I mentioned, uh, what we are going to cover today is principles of identification of trees in Indiana. And I'm going to walk through several of these principles, then we'll take a little pause and I'll check for any questions that you may have and we'll go through those. And then we'll talk about a few species uh, that you can uh, get some information on and these will use as examples of how to use these principles for identification of tree species you may run into. So the first thing we really want to do is, is uh, make sure that you have some good references available to you for using for tree identification. And there are several good ones out there. And I know for some of the Indiana Conservation Partners members, you may have native trees of the Midwest in your office already. Uh, if you do, this is an excellent resource and we'll show you some of the, the key points of using that particular guide. But there are several others out there that can do a really good job of helping you with identification of trees in the field. Another one I use an awful lot is pictured here, 101 Trees of Indiana by Marion Jackson. That's also a great field guide and actually fits nicely in a pocket. So if we use native trees of the Midwest for identification, there's a couple of ways you can use this field guide. Uh, you can utilize it by simply looking at the different characteristics of the plants you're trying to identify and going to the correct part of the book based on those plant characteristics and trying to match up the pictures to what you've got in front of you. And nothing wrong with that approach at all. In fact, as you become more familiar with trees and shrubs, that may be a relatively easy approach for you to use. If you're less sure about that identification approach and you want a more progressive systematic approach, you can actually use the keys that are found in this and other identification books to good effect to help essentially point you to the species or group of species that you may have in front of you based on those plant characteristics. And most of these keys will be what we call dichotomous keys or couplet keys. And so it provides you a couple of choices based on descriptions of the characteristics of the plant in front of you. So you may be looking at something like uh, uh, needle-like or all-like foliage on the plant. And based on what characteristic that is, you would make that selection and go to the number that's indicated based on that selection. And so it progressively moves you through these, these characteristics of the plant to the point where you're going to come to another couplet, a genus key, or an actual species name as the final end result. Some of the characteristics that are used for this are based on the foliage. And so if we're looking at our coniferous trees, some of the broad categories we can look at are how the needles are arranged and what kind of needles are on this tree. And so we have several species that have single needles, the hemlocks, the yews, firs, and spruces. Uh, some other species will have needles in clusters, uh, also called fascicles, and this is the pines. And here we've got pictured uh, eastern white pine, which has five needles per fascicle or cluster. And then some of the conifers have scale-like foliage. And so we've got things like junipers and cedars that have this scale-like or all-like foliage uh, that can either be relatively soft to the touch, in this case, uh, northern white cedar, or can be pretty prickly in the case of eastern red cedar. And that's one of our first uh, species we're going to take a look at. So eastern red cedar has prickly, uh, oftentimes all-like foliage, but sometimes it can be a little softer and scale-like. Uh, has these little, what looks like a red berry, but in fact, it is uh, a cone, a, a modified cone that's born on this coniferous tree. Uh, Eastern red cedar is pretty common in disturbed areas, not very shade tolerant. And one of its interesting characteristics, it has a rust disease that uh, is a co-host on apples and hawthorns. And uh, this is cedar apple rust. Another one of our conifers is eastern hemlock, a very restricted native range in Indiana, but we see it planted in quite a few locations. Uh, eastern hemlock has single needles that are attached to the twig, uh, very small cones. It gets to be quite a large tree with very dark, rough, rich bark. Also has very limber uh, limbs uh, that will have a tendency to droop quite a bit, particularly in snow events like we see here. Another one of our native conifers is eastern white pine. Uh, there are a few native populations, but in fact, it is planted much more extensively than we find it native in Indiana. 
Now, this would be one of our largest trees here in the state, very tall, uh, long-lived, five needles per cluster, a relatively long, thin-scaled cone. And as a young tree, it has a very conical and tight form. It's even more open with age. We have a couple of deciduous conifers here in Indiana as well. Uh, bald cypress is in the uh, redwood family, uh, native to southwestern Indiana, but planted across the state for a variety of purposes. Uh, this tree has very unusual, uh, almost fern-like soft foliage. Uh, these, uh, this whole uh, structure here is, an, is the needle, and it falls off in the fall, turns a rusty golden brown, and is deciduous like our hardwoods. And so in some cases, that's a little confusing to people, uh, recognizing it's a conifer, but it does lose its needles. And it's well known for growing in wet, swampy areas. And when it is in saturated soils or standing water, we get these project projections above the root system, uh, these knees or knobs that stick out of the water or out of the saturated soil. And that's a strong characteristic for bald cypress. Our other deciduous conifer is uh, eastern larch or tamarack. And this is found in the northeastern part of the state of Indiana native, uh, mostly in wetland and bog type habitats. Uh, you can see beautiful yellow fall coloration. It has single needles born in these clusters or spurs along the stems and a very uh, small little cone, uh, somewhat reminiscent of eastern hemlock. And in the spring, We'll have kind of a light yellowish to bright green, these needles coming out on these spurs or clusters that are along the stem. So I'm gonna stop sharing here for just a second and check the chat, see if we've got any questions, don't like we do. So everybody's still with us okay and can hear all right, hopefully. All right, I'll go back to the presentation. So now that we've taken a look at some of our conifers, we're gonna dive into our hardwoods. And these are by far the most common trees in Indiana and represent uh, the most species across the state. Uh, the broadleaf deciduous trees, uh, or as we oftentimes call them hardwoods, they can have opposite or alternate leaf and twig arrangement. And this is a great way to separate and kind of through process elimination, help us winnow down our choices in terms of what species we may be looking at. And so most of our native trees that are opposite fall into these categories, maple, ash, which is pictured here, dogwood, catalpa, buckeye, and we can use the uh, an acronym mad cat buck to remember that. So the maple ashes and dogwoods, catalpas and buckeyes have opposite leaf arrangement. So the leaves are gonna come out directly opposite each other on the stems. Most of our other species we're going to run into that are native hardwoods are alternate. And so we're looking at things like persimmon, which is pictured here, the oaks, elms, walnut, cherries, hickories, and many others in this category. So the opposites are kind of the unusual ones, the alternates, many more species in that group. So one of the things we've got to recognize is that when we're looking at this situation, we need to recognize that the leaf starts where there's a bud. Uh, and so when we're trying to define what the leaf is, we're looking for a bud that indicates the beginning of that leaf. And on the left-hand side here, we've got a black oak with large prominent buds. And that shows us where that leaf stem starts. However, in some cases, the leaf is actually covered, or pardon me, the bud is actually covered by the leaf. And so we've got a, a leaf stem here that completely covers the bud on this American sycamore. But what we can see is there's a difference in texture and color and appearance that helps us know here's the twig running up and down and the leaf coming off to the right. And so once we know leaf arrangement, whether it's alternate or opposite, we can also look at what type of leaves we're dealing with, whether they're simple, compound, or doubly compound. So simple leaves, uh, one of the most common categories, the maples, oaks, elms, aspens, sugar maple shown here. So it's a, a simple leaf stem and a single leaf blade, although lots of variations in sizes and shapes. And then we have compound leaves, 
Uh, and we have things like ash, hickories, walnut, sumac, and several others. And here is where we have a separate leaf stem that is attached to the twig of the tree and leaflets attached to that leaf stem. Uh, we also have doubly compound leaves. And here we have a uh, Kentucky coffee tree in this case, but we also have devil's walking stick. And in some cases, uh, honey locusts will also be doubly compound. And here we have a leaf stem with secondary leaf stems attached to it and leaflets attached to those secondary leaf stems. So these are very large leaves in many cases, two, three feet in length. And we have a couple different arrangements on these compound leaves. So we have pinnate arrangement where we have a long leaf stem and then leaflets arranged on the edge and end of that stem. And in this case, we've got sumac. And so this would be what we commonly see for things like ash, sumac, walnut, and hickory. We also have a palmate compound leaf arrangement. And one of our best examples here in Indiana is Ohio buckeye. And so these leaflets actually radiate out from a stem on a central source at the end of the stem, like the fingers on a palm. Well, the other thing we can find oftentimes is a key uh, definitive element of identification in some of the keys we would use or for photos we would look at is the leaf margins. And so what does that margin look like? Uh, does it have any teeth on it or is it smooth or what we would call entire? Uh, is it doubly toothed or does it have larger uh, projections on it, which we would call lobes? And so in this case, on the left-hand side, we've got a cherry leaf uh, with very weak, small teeth on the edge. We've got a dogwood leaf that is entire, no teeth on the margin. Uh, we've got an elm leaf here that is doubly toothed. They're also sometimes called doubly serrated. And so we have small teeth on top of very large teeth. And then the case here with sassafras, or we could have things like mulberry or the oaks, we have lobed leaves. And so these are significantly larger than just a small sawtooth edge on a tooth leaf. One of the other characteristics we find in a lot of keys is the length of the leaf stem. And so in many cases, that also reflects the size of the leaf in some cases. And so we oftentimes have short leaf stems on things like elm and hackberry, some of the white oaks that have relatively smaller leaves. We'll oftentimes have relatively long leaf stems on things like cottonwood, tulip tree, sweet gum. And those oftentimes re uh, reflect relatively large leaves but also uh, there's some variation in that as well. But the leaf stem length oftentimes is a pretty good identification characteristic and used in many keys. Now, when the leaves fall off, sometimes life gets a little tougher when it comes to tree ID, but there are some characteristics we can use and are also used in winter ID keys on the twig itself. And so these are some of the key characteristics on twigs that we can refer to that help us understand uh, some of the characteristics that will help us with identification. So the terminal bud is the bud at the very end of the twig, and oftentimes it has a slightly different character and look than some of the lateral buds, the buds that are along the sides of the twig. We also have what's called the, uh, the leaf scar, where the leaf fell off in the fall. And inside that leaf scar, oftentimes we can see vascular bundle scars. And so the vascular tissue that went between the leaf and the twig to carry the food and water back and forth, the scars of those are left behind. And those are diagnostic for many species of trees. In this case, we have butternut. And so butternut has a very diagnostic, large, uh, whitish gray, fuzzy uh, terminal bud, and also has a similar colored lateral buds and a very large leaf scar. And oftentimes those large leaf scars are indicative of a compound leaf, a very large leaf stem. We can also look at twig characteristics, uh, things like the pith, uh, the very core of the twig. Uh, this is butternut and butternut and walnut both have what's called chambered pith. And so we have this uh, uh, little empty chambers inside the center of the twigs. Many other pith in different Species of trees have various colors and textures. Uh, we can look at hair and fuzz on the twigs or the buds themselves. And so once again, on the upper right, we've got uh, 
butternut again, and butternut has this kind of fuzzy mustache of hair above the leaf scar. And also we have these little lenticels, uh, which are active in gas exchange, but also provide some good identification characteristics for some species. On the bottom, we have some species that will have lines, or we could also call those striations on the bark. This is wahoo, or American burning bush, and it has very uh, diagnostic four white lines that run up and down on the twigs, almost making the twig look square. Uh, some species, like bur oak in this case, or also we can find this on sweet gum, will have quirky ridges along the stems. And of course, bark can also be a big help for us in the winter once we get accustomed to using bark for identification. Uh, many species have relatively good characteristic bark. However, we can see a lot of variation in the size of the trees, the rate of growth, where they're growing, and even in local populations, we can see some variability. But once you become more familiar with bark, it can be a pretty good tool for winter tree ID. And it's kind of the primary way that many foresters identify trees uh, based on that acquired familiarity with what the bark looks like in their area. It can present some challenges though, because there's a lot of variation. And so on the left-hand side here, these are two Northern white oaks on a Purdue property standing right next to each other that I took a photo of because they've got strikingly different bark patterns. I recognize them both as Northern red oak because of the long running ridges with the silvery tops, but the uh, actual texture of the bark varies quite a bit. We can see this also in white oak. So these two photos are diff two different woodlots showing do two different kind of significant bark characteristics in white oak. And we even occasionally will get a, a fungal disease that uh, works on the bark of things like white oak and white ash called white patch disease uh, that flattens out the bark even more. Uh, this is typically not damaging to the tree, but it has a pretty big impact on the appearance. So bark is kind of an acquired skill. It's something we work on after we've used some of the other characteristics to become more familiar, familiar with those trees and give us some clues to identification, but a lot of variability. We're gonna talk about some of our categories of species here that you're going to run into probably on a pretty regular basis. And one of the biggest ones is the oaks. And we've got about uh, something like 17 species of oaks north to south across Indiana, and they can be a, a confusing group. Uh, some characteristics are quite similar between species. Uh, they oftentimes grow in close proximity to each other on the same type of sites. So this is where those guidebooks can be really useful and helpful for you in identification. Uh, I've got several of the white oak group here. Uh, we do have two broad groups of oaks, the white oaks and the red oaks. Uh, the white oaks are typified by rounded lobes on the leaf margins, by acorns that mature in one season, and uh, by typically light gray ashy colored bark although there are some exceptions to those, as there always are in nature. And so here we've got white oak, Quercus alba, uh, a lot of variation in the leaves, but typically we find these kind of rounded finger-like lobes on the leaves, but, but very variable. Nice chestnut brown acorn with kind of a gray knobby cap. Chinkapin oak can throw you a little bit for a loop. Uh, it almost looks like it's got a little sharp tip on the end of those lobes, but in fact, that's just a little gland there. It still belongs in the white oak group, acorns that mature in one season. A very dark and small acorn with a light gray cap, highly favored by wildlife. Uh, bur oak, uh, very distinct, very deep sinus, the spaces between the lobes, about halfway down that leaf, and then a broad lobes on the top, is very typical for bur oak. And also that diagnostic egg, large acorn with the uh, mossy or burr edge to the cap really helps us with identification. Swamp chestnut oak is a, a bottom of oak of the southern part of the state. Uh, very broad uh, leaves with many shallowly, shallowly lobe, uh, uh, lobes on the edges, small sinuses, but lots of lobes on the edges. And uh, the acorns are so hot highly favored by the squirrels. I could not find an acorn for that particular example of swamp chestnut oak. And another good characteristic for all the oaks is the terminal bud cluster. And so at the very end of the twig, we're gonna find several buds clustered together and also leaves associated with that. 
And that's a strong characteristic for practically all of the oaks we're going to run into. And the red oak group, we have bristle tipped lobes. And so at the very ends of these lobes, we have a little bristle or hair that looks like a little sharp point. And we have several species of these in Indiana. The acorns mature in two seasons. So there will be two seasons worth of acorn crop on red oaks. Uh, pin oak is a uh, one of the red oak group uh, that's oftentimes found in wet soils, uh, swampy sites, acidic sites. It's planted as a street tree a lot, but oftentimes kind of suffers in the street tree environment because it does want slightly acidic soil. Uh, nice, neat little acorn with a very tight little cap on top. Black oak is a species of uh, uplands uh, and dry sites. Uh, has a very shaggy edge to the cap and also striping on the acorns themselves. Uh, Northern red oak. Uh, typically has pretty large acorns and a very shallow cap at the very top of the acorn. A little bit broader leaf than we typically find on black oak. Black oak, the tops of leaves typically are kind of shiny. Uh, the tops of the leaves in northern red oak, more of a matte finish, not nearly as shiny as black oak. Shingle oak is kind of unusual here in Indiana. It's our only oak that has no lobes on the margin of the leaf, but it does have a little bristle tip at the very tip end of the leaf, showing us it's in that red oak group. Uh, it has relatively small acorns with uh, a cap that covers about a third to half of the acorn itself. So the oaks are all alternate simple leaves, as are a few other examples here. Eastern redbud, uh, Circus canadensis. This is a small tree, uh, probably Often enough, it's large enough that we would put it in the tree category rather than the shrub category, but not, not a great big tree by any means, not long lived particularly either. Nice heart shaped leaves alternately arranged on the twig. You can see where the leaves are zigzagging back and forth on that stem. The leaves have entire margins, and this is actually in the legume family and it has what looks like little bean pods for seeds. Uh, compare that to American basswood which has heart-shaped leaves, but has tooth margins. And so that's a good separating characteristic between our Eastern red bud and our basswood. Basswood gets to be a large tree, relatively rough bark with long running ridges, and has a very interesting little fruit that's got a, a wing on it, almost like a little helicopter with uh, little berries uh, of fruit hanging below that wing. The walnuts in Indiana are composed of black walnut, which is much more common, and butternut, which has actually become quite a rare tree in the state now. Uh, black walnut, probably familiar to a lot of you, dark, heavily ridged bark, uh, alternate compound leaves with many leaflets along the side. Sometimes on, on many of the leaflets, the very terminal leaflet will be missing. So there'll just be a pair of leaflets at the very end of that uh, large compound leaf. The round nuts, with the husks that'll stain your fingers. Uh, very hard nut on the inside, but uh, tasty on the inside, but definitely a lot of work to get to that. Uh, butternut on the other hand has become quite rare. There's a fungal canker disease that's killed many trees. It's also not a long lived tree and requires disturbance to regenerate. Butternut has more of an oblong nuts, as you can see here, almost look like little lemons. Uh, and the husks tend to be kind of a clammy, sticky texture but they will also stain your hands, kind of a yellowish brown color. Uh, the, leaf, the leaves on butternut oftentimes will have a terminal leaflet as we see here in the upper right hand corner. That's not nearly as common in black walnut. And you can see a slightly different bark pattern, uh, flat ridges with silvery tops and dark gray underneath. Another characteristic that helps us separate black walnut from butternut is this hairy mustache or eyebrow above the leaf scar on butternut, black walnut, and the associated hickories uh, lack this fuzzy top on top of the leaf scar. Closely related to the uh, butternuts and walnuts are the hickories and pecans. This is a, uh, a complicated group. There's several species in Indiana, and some of these can look quite a bit alike. Uh, so once again, good place to have your guidebooks. Uh, the leaf in the center here is from shellbark hickory. This is a bottomland or wet site species. 
typically with seven to nine leaflets, you can see the leaves get progressively larger as we head toward the end of that large compound leaf. Uh, the bark on the tree on the right-hand side is shagbark hickory. Shell bark and shagbark both have very uh, similar shaggy loose plates of bark on the trees that most people can recognize pretty well. Uh, shagbark hickory is an upland species that typically has five leaflets. I've got a photo here on the left-hand side of a, a dried up leaf and the nuts, uh, relatively small nut with very thick hulls. The nuts on shellbark hickory are very large, but also similarly very heavy, uh, thick hulls. So a very large nut. And then the pecans and bitternut hickories have very thin hulls on the nuts. And once again, uh, oftentimes more than seven leaflets and leaflets being progressively larger toward the end of that compound leaf. Bitternut hickory bark here. So not all the hickories have shaggy bark. Some have quite tight bark. Uh, bitternut, very diagnostic with those tight ridges and a silvery gray appearance. Another species that you're gonna run into a lot of here in Indiana is sugar maple. Uh, this is a very shade tolerant species. So not only is it a forest overstory species, but also we'll find it in the understory of our forest areas. Uh, it has opposite simple leaves. So leaves held directly opposite each other, cast an enormous amount of shade, but can tolerate shade. So we'll find it growing in the canopy, under the canopy of other trees, and then produce these little winged samaras in the fall. Uh, it's a hard maple where our soft maples, which we're gonna take a look at next, produce their seed in the spring. So red maple is one of our soft maples, and we categorize those not only by the relative density of the wood to the hard maples, but also they tend to flower and produce their seed early in the spring and summer as opposed to the fall. Uh, so here we've got red maple. This is a species we can find on a wide variety of sites. And so we oftentimes associate it with wetland sites, but in fact, it can grow in a lot of different locations here in Indiana, wet to dry. Opposite simple leaves. It has uh, much more sharp margins on the edge of the leaf, uh, more tooth than we find on sugar maple. Little V-shaped sinuses between the lobes, uh, three to five lobe leaf typically. And it's well named, it's fall color, oftentimes leans toward reds and maroons. And the uh, little seeds, a small wing pair of seeds uh, also tends to be reddish in the spring. Silver maple, probably a little more common here in Indiana than red maple. Once again, a, a bottomland floodplain type of species, but we'll find it opportunistically growing in a lot of locations. Very silver underside to the leaf, one of the ways it gets its name. Large uh, paired wing seeds or samaras as they're called, the helicopters that we're so familiar with in the spring. Uh, smooth to flaky gray bark and a very fast growing tree, one of our fastest growing hardwoods here in Indiana. Opposite simple leaves. And we have a, an invasive here as well we run into more frequently than we historically have. It's been planted in cities and towns for many years. That's Norway maple. We see the regular green variety here, but also sometimes the horticultural selection, uh, Crimson King, which tends to be a, a kind of a deep purplish red color. Uh, very shade tolerant and can in some cases even outcompete sugar maple. And so we're a little concerned about this one as an invasive species. Wide leaves that are reminiscent of sugar maple, but if we break the stems, we'll have a little white milky sap inside of those as opposed to the clear sap in sugar maple. And the uh, you can see the wing seeds are a little different. The wings stick straight out where the wings on sugar maple have a tendency to kind of point down. Now we're coming to opposite uh, leaves, and this is opposite compound leaves instead of simple leaves. And the ashes are in this category. Uh, we've lost a lot of the ashes in Indiana to emerald ash borer, but you will still certainly encounter them both as a few live trees and then as regeneration in the forest understory or in edge areas. Uh, green ash is a species common to moist to wet sites. Uh, compound leaves, this typical, typ typical ridged bark with a uh, light tan underbark. And once the emerald ash borer gets in, the woodpeckers really start working on it. And you can see that underbark very clearly it's a good sign that the tree has emerald ash borer with all the outer bark pecked away from the woodpecker activity. So opposite compound leaves. 
another species that has opposite compound leaves, but uh, is in a, a different category is box elder. And box elder is actually a maple. And so it's our only maple in Indiana that has compound leaves as opposed to simple leaves. And you can see the very strong similarity of the seeds on our right-hand photo to our other maples. And so box elder, uh, three to five leaflets typically, opposite leaf arrangement. Uh, the three leaflets look a lot like poison ivy, but poison ivy has alternate leaf arrangements. So a good way to tell them apart. Ohio buckeye is opposite and also a compound leaf, but this is our different leaf arrangement. This is the palmately compound. And so we've got typically five leaflets on Ohio buckeye radiating from one point at the end of the leaf stem. Uh, Ohio buckeye also has a, a relatively large terminal bud that has scales, almost looks like uh, snake scales on it. Uh, and the Ohio buckeye, if you scrape the bark or break a twig, it has kind of a stunky odor to it. Relatively large leaf scars you can see on this photo on the, the right-hand side, oftentimes an indication we've got a large leaf, which may be a compound leaf. Definitely the case in Ohio buckeye. So those are several species, and the, the scope of this presentation doesn't allow me to cover anything close to the over 100 species of trees that we have here in Indiana. But what I hope to do is provide you with some clues you can use to help you uh, use a good tree ID guide to progressively identify based on the characteristics we've talked about. Now, one of the other clues that you can use in some cases is some tree species associate strongly with certain types of sites. And so we've got some species that are well adapted to really wet sites. I think about things like bald cypress, uh, black, uh, black ash in the swamps. Uh, there's several species like this, pin oak, that we'll find in particular sites where we've got high moisture standing water situations. Uh, swamp white oak would be another example. But we can also have some situations where we've got species that'll associate with very dry sites. And this is the case with many of our upland oaks and some of our upland hickories. So I think about things like black oak and shingle oak, uh, to some extent white oak on our high dry sites, uh, chestnut oak in southern Indiana on the high knobs in south central Indiana. And then we think about floodplain areas where we have seasonal flooding and we can oftentimes things, find things like cottonwood, sycamore, uh, sweet gum, and even pecan. This can be somewhat helpful to us the problem is it's not always consistent. Uh, some trees will be opportunistic in terms of where they grow, and so they'll pop up in places they really, we don't think they belong, but they manage to make it there, and they'll surprise us. So this is a guide, but not necessarily always reliable in terms of kind of thinking about what species we're going to run into. And so I kind of think like to think about the idea of going through a tree ID protocol, uh, working through progressively to think about the identification of different species. So are the leaves scale or needle-like? And so I'm thinking about my conifers. Or are they broad and in most cases deciduous or broadleaf trees? What's the leaf branch pattern? Is it alternate or is it opposite? The twig characteristics. So I'm looking at things like the leaf scars, uh, the vascular bundle scars, lenticels. Uh, what, what's the arrangement of those? What's the size of the leaf scars? How many vascular bundle scars? Uh, is there hair on the buds or the twigs that is gonna help me with using a key to determine what that species is? Then the leaf type, if I've got it available, is it simple, compound, or doubly compound? And then looking at the leaf margins, if, if I've got those available, are the entire tooth, doubly tooth, uh, do we have on the stems any uh, lenticels, striations, lines, or cork that can help me with identification? And the real way we categorize trees is actually through flowers and fruit, uh, the reproductive parts of the tree. The problem is that oftentimes we don't have those readily available to us uh, through most of the season. And so flowers are pretty short-lived. Uh, and fruit oftentimes is in the upper parts of the tree, or if it uh, comes down, oftentimes wildlife utilize it very rapidly. And so we may not have those available. But if you do, those can be great for identification, particularly things like uh, uh, acorns and hickory nuts for separating some of the species of oak and hickory. 
And then also, uh, once we get more familiar with our species using the bark, and then also sometimes referring to that issue of what kind of site it's growing on to give us some keys and clues as to what we think we might run into. And so as we mentioned, some of the good references for identification are uh, Native Trees of the Midwest um, by Weeks and Parker. Uh, this is produced by Purdue University Press, uh, but is available online through a variety of outlets. Uh, occasionally is, is offered through the Purdue Extension Education Store, although I think they're sold out at the moment. Uh, we're going to do our next presentation on Thursday on uh, shrubs and woody vines of Indiana. And that is a great reference book, uh, also available from the same sort of outlets by the same authors. I mentioned previously 101 Trees of Indiana from Mary and Jackson, readily available through a lot of different outlets, bookstores, and online sales. I like that book for field purpose because it fits easily in a back pocket and it has a, a nice water resistant outer shell. So great to carry in the field with me. And then I've been working on a series of videos of uh, about two to three minutes each for identification of native Indiana trees. And you can find those under our video section uh, at Purdue Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Media. And there's the website there available for you. Uh, so if you've got some additional interest in some of our native trees, uh, that's a great way to, to get a quick introduction to several different species. And so uh, uh, I'm going to take the rest of the time here to answer your questions, but I would appreciate it if you would uh, take the time to uh, give us some feedback on this particular program. And so I've got a, a survey set up online you can follow this QR code with your QR code scanner to the survey, or you can use this link, and I will try to put the link in the, the uh, chat box so you can connect with it there as well. Uh, but we would appreciate your feedback on this also.